everyone. Welcome back to Carrie's Corner. Hope you had a great weekend. Maybe you played some games with your family or on your own. Maybe you read some books. Maybe you read some books out loud or had some rest and just had fun all around on some level and feel ready for the week. So I'm ready for this week because we are continuing with The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, illustrated by Eric Kincaid. We're beginning in the middle of chapter to the wild wood and here we go and now this snow makes everything look so very different remember they were lost out in the snow in the wild wood it did indeed the mole would not have known that it was the same wood however they set out bravely and took the line that seemed most promising holding on to each other and pretending that they recognized an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them, or saw openings, gaps, or paths with a familiar turn in them in the endless scene of white space and black tree trunks that refused to vary. An hour or two later, they had lost all count of time. They pulled up, downhearted, weary, and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what has to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their little legs through it, and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood and no beginning and no difference in it. And worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it or do something or other. The cold is too awful for anything and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. This is what occurs to me. There's a sort of dell down there in front of us where the ground seems all hilly and bumpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try and find some sort of shelter or cave or hole with a dry floor to it out of the snow and the wind, and then we'll have a good rest before we try again, for both of us are pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off or something may turn up. So once more they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell, where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the bitter wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits the rat had spoken of, when suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old mole, said Rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at the leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get at my handkerchief and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump said the mole miserably. Oh my, oh my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something in the metal. Funny, he pondered a while and examined the bumps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, no, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar and his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him. Let's look at those pictures and then we will continue. And was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily, while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Oh, come on, rat! Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! And then, Hooray, 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 and danced feebly jig on the snow. What have you found, Ratty? asked the mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see, said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last slowly, I see it right enough. Seen the same sort of thing before lots of times. Familiar object, I call it a door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance jigs around a door scraper? But don't you see what it means, you, you dull-witted animal? 
cried the rat impatiently. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It simply means that some very careless and forgetful person has left his door scraper lying out in the middle of the wild wood, just where it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. When I get home, I shall go and complain about it to, to uh, somebody or other. See if I don't. Oh dear, oh dear, cried the rat in despair. Here, stop arguing and come and scrape. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around them. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you, exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Absolutely nothing, whatever, replied the mole with perfect truthfulness. Well, now, he went on, you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter done for and thrown away, and I suppose you're perfectly happy. Better go ahead and dance your jig round that if you've got to and get it over, and then perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps. Can we eat a doormat? Or sleep under a doormat? Or sit on a doormat and sledge home over the snow on it, you exasperating rodent? Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole quite grumpily. I think we've got enough of this folly. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. They are not that sort at all. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, 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 you thick-headed beast, replied the rat, really angry. This must stop. Not another word, but scrape. Scrape and scratch and dig and hunt around, especially on the sides of the hummocks. If you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for it's our last chance. The rat attacked a snowbank beside them with great energy, probing with his cudgel everywhere and then digging with fury. And the mole scraped busily too, more to oblige the rat than for any other reason. For his opinion was that his friend was getting lightheaded. Some 10 minutes hard work and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. He worked till he could get a paw through and feel, then called the mole to come and help him. Hard at it went the two animals till at last the result of their labors stood full in view of the astonished mole. In the side of what seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid looking little door painted a dark green. An iron bell pull hung by the side and below it on a small brass plate neatly engraved in capital letters they could read by the aid of moonlight, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards on the snow from sheer surprise and delight. Rat, he cried, you're a wonder, a real wonder. That's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step in that wise head of yours from the very moment that I fell and cut my shin and and you looked at the cut and at once your majestic mind said to yourself, door scraper, and then you turned to and found the very door scraper that done it. Did you stop there? No. Some people would have been quite satisfied, but not you. Your intellect went on working. Let me only just find a doormat, says you to yourself, and my theory is proved. And of course you found your doormat. You're so clever. I believe you could find anything you liked. All right, there's some fun pictures. Finding that door. This is good news. Now, says you, the door exists as plain as if I saw it. There's nothing else remains to be done but to find it. Well, I've read about that sort of thing in books, but I've never come across it before in real life. You ought to go where you'll be properly appreciated. You're simply wasted here among us fellows. If I only had your head, Ratty. But as you haven't, interrupted the rat rather unkindly, I suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk? Get up at once and hang on to that bell pull you see there and ring hard, as hard as you can while I hammer. While the rat attacked the door with his stick, the mole sprang up at the bell pull, clutched it and swung there, both feet well off the ground, and from quite a long way off, they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond. There they are ringing the doorbell. And we're going to go a little bit into Chapter 4, Mr. Badger. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping on the snow to keep their feet warm. At last, they heard the sound of slow shuffling, footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers, 
that were too large for him and down at the heel, which was clever of Mr. Mole because that was exactly what it was. There was a noise of a bolt shot back and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy blinking eyes. No, this very next time this happens, said a gruff voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time disturbing people on such a night? Speak up. Oh, Badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What? Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the Badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must be frozen. Well, I never lost in the snow and in the wild wood, too, and at this time of night, but come in. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and with great joy and relief, heard the door shut behind them. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw and had probably been on his way to bed when he heard their call. He looked kindly on them and patted both their heads. This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along, come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an excited sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long, tunnel-like passages. But there were doors in the hall as well, stout oak doors. One of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large fire lit kitchen. That's where we're gonna stop. They're cozy in Badger's kitchen. Stay tuned tomorrow, tune in to Carrie's Corner and we will continue with The Wind and the Willows by Kenneth Graham. See you tomorrow. <laughs>